This is Dr. Liz, Senior Pastor at Antioch International Church, and I want to personally welcome and thank you for joining us today. We are so glad you are here because this podcast, Dancing in the Rain Community, is designed for you. And now, here is your host, Mr. Cyril Prabhu, the founder of Proverbs 226. Good morning, podcast viewers. We are so happy to come to your life this morning from Charlotte, North Carolina. As you know, we've been doing this podcast based on a book that I wrote in 2012 called Are You Dancing in the Rain? When I wrote that book, what inspired me to write is that, you know, I ran into people in my life who poured so much and invested in my life on learning how to dance when life happens, right? Every one of us have a situation in our life where the things that we run into causes us to just like, you know, think, oh my God, why? Why me, God? Why is this happening? When we hear like a a, a news from the doctor that says like a, you have, a, you know, XYZ terminal disease or a cancer, we have no idea how to handle them. And, and there are situations like, a, you know, um, where we just like a hear a, a husband and wife separate from themselves or the children moving out of the house or a business broken down. We don't actually have schools and colleges teaches us how to handle when life happens, right? And recently, I was listening to a message by Jensen Franklin, Pastor Jensen Franklin, and he said that uh, there is an ornamental fish uh, named koi, right? C-O-Y. And this fish, when it is put into a tank that has like a like a, a small tank, you know, it can grow to a maximum of four inches, right? But the same fish, when we put them in a, a larger tank that can go up to 11 inches tall, right? But the same fish, when you put them in a pond with a lot of water, can grow all the way up to four feet and 35 pounds, right? What is this fish doing? It is sourcing the energy from the environment. And we are the same way as well. We need to source energy from each other. The Bible says, uh, you know, as the iron sharpens iron, we need to sharpen each other. So my prayer this morning, as you're watching this, if you're going through a rough time, if your going is getting tough, uh, all I'm here to say is that uh, source energy from interviews like what we are doing with uh, this podcast. Right? And today I have a special guest uh, with us, an associate warden from Trenton Correctional. And what I saw with uh, A.W. Elaine is something special that I could not figure out what it is. We work with uh, so many officers, we work with wardens, we work with chaplains, we work with so many people in SCDC and NCDPS and uh, uh, Texas and South Dakota, but some people, when we work with them, there is a, a vibe that we get out of them, a positive energy, right? And so later, I just found out about A.W., and why she was doing. And so today we will listen to A.W. in asking her the question, the very question that I had when I met with her the first time. But you are all in for a treat as we go in and interview A.W. Elaine Freeman. Thank you, A.W., for joining us this morning to come and sit with us and talk to us about uh, who you are and what you're doing and uh, what God is doing in your life. We are so excited to have you uh, this morning with us. You know, what I, I fondly remember is like uh, very recently, I got a picture from you that uh, you took um, during a Christmas time uh, with your family. And uh, when I saw that, I was just so amazed by all the people uh, in one picture. And you said, like, this is my family, <laughs> you know. So, A.W., tell us a little bit about you and tell us a little bit about your family. Okay. Well, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me thank you. to come and be a part of this podcast. Um, I was very touched Amen. that you even asked me 
um, to be a part of it. I am fortunate to have turned 53 years old. Excellent. I have three beautiful daughters. Wonderful. And they brought into the family three handsome son-in-laws. Oh, wonderful. And we have a little prince and two princes. Wonderful. Which are my grandchildren. Excellent. And um, I've been working for the Department of Corrections for 29 years. Wow. 29 years. I'm married to a very handsome guy. Excellent. Which was my high school sweetheart. Oh, wonderful. So we've been married almost 35 years come May. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And um, A.W., um, I know that uh, your family is so important. Mm -hmm. Where are you from originally? Are you from South Carolina or did yes. you? Oh, wonderful. Yes. Which part of South Carolina? I Ida? was born and raised in Edgefield County. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Morning. So not too far from where you are right now. No, sir. Not too far. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> yes, wonderful. Sir. So, A.W., tell us a little bit about like uh, why you chose to be uh, an officer or an associate warden in uh, uh, an agency like a SEDC. There's got to be something, because a lot of times what I find ourselves is like, uh, you know, there is something about like going to work and earning, uh, uh, you know, resources for our family, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, you know, when I hear people that are working in a, a, a company for 29 years, mm -hmm. it's not the work. It's not, um, you know, what you want to bring home as a salary. There's got to be something more for you to be there and working for this agency for 29 years. What is your motivational factor, AW? I've come to learn that it's my passion mm. for helping others. Mm. I never realized it until I worked for years but I've come to realize that you gotta love what you do. Absolutely. And and I absolutely love what I do. Excellent. I started in 1992 as a correction officer, mm -hmm. and I learned that when you give respect, you get respect. And over the years that I've been in corrections, I've learned to respect others, not because of who they are, but because of who I am. Wonderful. I mean. Again, you have to have a passion right. for, for what you do. And, Absolutely. And I have that passion. I learned that I have that passion, especially when I tend to go out of my way mm -hmm. a lot just to make sure that things run smooth. Absolutely. I know A.W. <laughs> she goes out of the way. The very first time that we went to Trenton, I can tell there is some warmth that we found and we were sourcing that energy from AW. And here's the thing, you podcasters that are listening to this message, I know, you know, going to a job, like going to work Monday through Friday, sometimes can look like a chore, sometimes look like a drag. You probably want to say, man, I want to <laughs> quit this job. But can you imagine someone going into a prison and working there day in and day out for 29 years. It has to be a calling. It has to be something that they really love. And that's what we're going to listen from A.W. Um, Elaine this morning. But here's the thing. Very recently, I know that um, the facility that you're working with, Trenton Correctional, um, you know, the guys who are cooking food had uh, uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, you showed up in the mornings, like a 4.35 or even earlier to cook food mm -hmm. because uh, your staff, uh, the guys who are uh, cooking food, mm -hmm. uh, you know, had a COVID and they could not come in to, uh, to cook the food. Tell us a little bit about what is your day like when you go to work every day? Oh, wow. It's interesting. It's <laughs> very interesting. Um, well, my day starts with making sure the institution is running smoothly. Right. Um, I address concerns of the staff. And whenever I go out on the yard, if the inmates are walking by, I um, address their concerns as well. Absolutely. Um, just making sure that the institution is running smoothly, making sure that my staff is taken care of. Right. Any issues that we may have, we get them addressed. Right. And just put out the fire immediately. You know, it may start as a small fire. Right. But we want to get it put out so that everything can continue 
to run smoothly. So it's it's a pretty busy day. Of course, yeah. of course. Yeah, and on top of answering the phone calls and and answering the warden. So yes. my whole goal throughout the day is that when I get to work, I want to make sure that the warden has little to worry about. Right. Um, make sure everything she needs is right there in front of her, and only thing I need her to do is sign, and then I'll go from there. Wonderful. Yes, sir. Fantastic. A.W., how many men are serving time in Trenton as of uh, this month? Uh, from what I can recall, we have approximately 400 offenders. Excellent. Uh, okay. Fortunately, our numbers are going down because they're being released. However, we haven't been able to receive any new guys in okay. because of COVID. Right. You know, right. But it's, right. it's looking up. It's looking positive. Unbelievable. I cannot believe the answer that you gave uh, uh, A.W. because uh, when I was writing the book, what amazed me uh, when I looked at the people that I came across in my life is that uh, they've always told me that, uh, you know, as part of their life, they've always figured out a way to help somebody to be successful. Mm -hmm. All of these people that I ran into that didn't know how to dance in their own life have figured out to tailor their life to help somebody else, mm -hmm. right? In this case, you're helping the men inside the prison. In this, you're helping the warden inside the prison. You're, you're a mom taking uh, you know, care of your family. When I think about all of that, A.W., is this... Uh, it reminds me of my uncle, right? He was uh, um, like a deputy collector, right? Which is equivalent to a mayor, mm -hmm. right? And uh, when I was in college, this was my very first day going to college, right? And so um, I had to go and pay the fees standing in this long line when my uncle uh, is working in a town, which is about like a three, four hours of a drive mm -hmm. from my college, right? And this was like a 8.39 in the morning, and I'm standing all by myself trying to pay my fees. And I, and I saw my uncle walk by to stand next to me. Mm. And I was thinking, this is like a, 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 a person who's like a deputy collector of a, a, a town nearby, but he's walking. There was no car, nothing. He actually, that morning, got up probably 3.34 in the morning and went to a public uh, transportation station and got on a bus, traveled three, three and a half hours to get there to stand with me on the line to pay my fees, right? That morning, he would have thought, this guy is going to stand all by himself mm. while all the other boys will have their fathers next to them, right? He tailored like this his entire life trying to figure out how he can be an assistance to someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, later, I had a chance to go to India, and every time we go from uh, U.S. to India, the first few days you're visiting your cousins, uh, you're visiting your uh, uh, close family, Every time you go in after like a five years, four years, right? And they all have their children married. They all have their, um, you know, children have children, right? There's like a, the family expanding. And they have all taken pictures of like a, all the important moments, right? And when we go to see them, they would show this album. It's not like a, any more a fashion to have like an album with pictures, but there used to be a time we have like albums to see, right? So every time I would look at the album of like a main events happening in someone else's life, I would always see my uncle standing there doing some work, wow. right? My point is this, uh, uh, this morning, that the people who care about someone else, uh, who care about the success of someone else, uh, has always been an instrument in investing in someone's life. So if you are someone looking to change something in your life, looking to see how I can be useful to somebody, those are the characters 
that I've seen people have in this journey that I've been, that, that has helped somebody to get better, has always been a key characteristic of someone that has succeeded in their life, right? A.W., one of the things that uh, I was very uh, touched by you is the first time when we came into uh, Trenton Correctional, when Proverbs 26 came into Trenton Correctional. And the thing is that um, whenever we want to go into a prison, we would actually make phone calls to the warden. We would actually go to uh, SCDC headquarters to get permission to go into any one of the facilities, right? But in your case, I remember very distinctly you calling me so many times to bring Proverbs 2 to 6 into Trenton. Tell me, A.W., why is that important? Why is Proverbs 2 to 6 is important from your mindset? Because we've always seen, like, we would, we would come into a prison and we would do all these things in the lives of these men and women and children. We always have a perspective from our perspective, mm-hmm. right? So from the other side of the fence, right, you must have seen something in the lives of these men. You must have seen something uh, in this program, Proverbs 2 to 6. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, why Proverbs 2 to 6 in Trenton? Well, upon conducting research for the Proverbs 2 to 6, I spoke with my warden about it. And she was very, very supportive of bringing the program to Trenton. And the more research that I did on Proverbs 226 helped me to understand that these guys needed this. Right. Because they needed some type of hope. Right. That once they're released from prison, um, they will want to do better Mm -hmm. as far as their children, as far as their parents, as far as their, their siblings. They would want to be a better and productive citizen once they're released. Right. And um, after watching the videos and seeing the love that was shared among the children and the fathers and the washing of the feet and putting the new shoes on, I knew that these guys would really enjoy this and there's something that they will be able to remember for the rest of their lives. So that's why I was pretty adamant about getting you to come and bring the program to Trenton. And I I don't regret a minute that I did it. Perfect. That's amazing, uh, A.W. You talked about research, right? And uh, how it is helping these men, um, you know, change their lives. We've seen that same research as well, that uh, one of the research says that uh, if a man or a woman that gets uh, incarcerated, right? And if they have a sentence of over five years, there is a very large possibility that uh, the families, uh, you know, don't show up mm-hmm. in, in their visitation. And that is one of the goals of Proverbs 2 to 6 as well. Because when these men come into prison or these women come into prison, their children are like a three years old or four years old. But by the time they finish their sentence seven, eight years later, when they come out of the facility, they still think of that child as a three-year-old mm-hmm. and a four-year-old, not as a teenager, not that they have grown, they have, you know, have um, the different perspective, right? But also what we have found is that, like what you said, A.W., that washing of the feet, mm-hmm. Uh, has changed the lives of not only the children, but also the fathers. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we have seen like uh, so many of these fathers that get down on their knees and wash their children's feet. Uh, We have seen like uh, over this last eight plus years uh, that uh, it has reduced the number of men that come back into prison. Nationally, the statistic says uh, that 70% of these men, when they are released from prison, will come back in in the first 30 to 90 days, Mm. right? But these fathers who wash their children's feet, only 1.8% come back Mm. into prison. In the women's prison, we haven't seen even one mother that has washed 
their son or daughter's feet has ever come back into prison. And there is something about washing of the feet. And we are right now going into an Easter. Next week is uh, like a holy week. And that uh, we're going to see the Good Friday. And we're going to see so many of these are going to come around the washing of the feet. There's something that Jesus did the night before he was crucified. He got on his knees and he washed the feet of uh, their disciples, right? And and the thing is, he may not have done that, right? But he did. And it changed the trajectory of each and every one that was inside that room. And we pray that's exactly the same thing will happen in the lives of these men and women that are serving time in prison. And we have seen over the years, not only the fathers starting to do uh, well, inside the prison, because we did a study in Perry Correctional. We found out 85% of these men that washed their children's feet, right, during one of these Proverbs 2 to 6 event, have stopped getting themselves into a disciplinary action. 85% of them, they won't even get into one disciplinary action after they wash their children's feet. There's something about washing of the feet, and that's what we are so passionate about, taking it into the, the prison facility, because it just uh, uh, gives a healing a new dimension. It gives a healing a new hope. And we pray that these children and these fathers will hang on to those cherishable moments in their life, that when they come out of the facility, they will not go back in to those prisons again. They will go back to being a father, go back to being the husband, go back to, to being their sons for these uh, beautiful families. So, A.W., the question that I have for you is, uh, when I, whenever I talk to you, mm -hmm. you talk so much about your faith. The faith is so important for you, right? Can you tell us a little bit about your faith uh, in God? And uh, why is that important for you? My faith. Wow. I love talking about faith. We know that Hebrews 11 and 1 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Yep. And the evidence of things not seen. Right. I hold that true to my heart. Yes. I believe in faith because I believe that it's faith that has gotten me to where I am and to be the person that I am. I use my faith daily throughout the day. Mm -hmm. um, I just believe that my faith just keeps me elevated, mm. keeps my mind right, and, mm -hmm. and keeps me doing what's right in the mm -hmm. sight of God. Mm. Because I also know scripture tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please, to please God. God. Right. And the great thing about faith is that it doesn't have to be huge. Right. The scripture says it just the size of a mustard seed. That's, right. that's all the faith you need and you can move mountains. Right. And so whenever I get ready to work on a project or whatever it is I'm working on, I give it 100% faith that right. it's going to work out well. For example, when I was listing, creating a spreadsheet for the guys that wanted to be a part of Proverbs 226, I made sure that everything was in order because I'm a perfectionist in everything right. that I do. So I want to make sure that whenever I submit something to someone, that it's in perfect condition because... Right. God, that's how God wants us. We're not perfect, but we're striving to be perfect. And so I believe with my faith, I can continue to strive to be perfect in everything that I do. That was wonderful, A.W. You talked about Hebrews chapter, uh, you know, 11, 1, it was it? Uh, where it's, a, it's talking about like a faith is a substance, right? For making like a table, you need a substance, like a word, for making anything in this world, you need a substance. But in this life, uh, we need faith as in a critical substance for us. And it is for 
the journey of Proverbs 2 to 6 as well, A.W., uh, we believe very strongly uh, about like how our faith is driving every single day of this journey. Uh, can you imagine when we started this in 2012 in uh, Kersha Karakshna, right? That morning, we had no idea if uh, those men will even buy what we are talking mm -hmm. about, right? But today, we have 16,000 children in this program uh, in four states. Uh, in Texas, we can go into any one of these facilities. Mm -hmm. But every day walk in Proverbs 2 to 6 is like a faith walk. We know very well that uh, this journey that we are in, the vision that we have, is much bigger than what we can accomplish. Unless God shows up, uh, even yesterday night we were doing a Bible study about like uh, the, the walls of Jericho. The walls of Jericho is going to come down. God knows the walls of Jericho is going to come down. God knows that they have to do nothing to get the walls of Jericho come down. But here's the thing, that whether they did anything or not, the walls came down because God has already predetermined that the walls are not going to stand between us and the problem. I do not know who you are watching this podcast. And if you have a Jericho, a walls of Jericho standing in front of you, you don't need to worry about the walls coming down. It is not you to figure out how part. It is God's part. Your, your job and my job is to walk in this faith and letting God do what he does really well. A.W., one of the things that I am always uh, amazed by uh, is like uh, whenever you talk about your father, I can see a glow in your face, right? Tell us a little bit about your dad. Okay. Well, I am a special case because I have three dads. I have my adopted father. I have my biological father. And then there was my stepdad who was in my life until June of last year. Mm. Um, my adopted father married my mom when she was expecting me. Mm. And so I took on his last name. Right. And when I turned 18, I had met my, I met my biological father. Um, one day my mom told me, this is your father. Mm. But I only knew of daddy, mm -hmm. the one that raised me. So right. I only knew of him, but even... Knowing who my biological father was at the age of 18, right. he still accepted me as his daughter. Wonderful. Even though he has four other daughters, right. he still accepted me as his daughter. Right. And then there is my stepdad, who my mom married about 25 years ago. And ever since he's been in our lives, he's, he's been the perfect dad. Mm. I could say the perfect right. dad, no matter what I needed. Or when, when, whenever, whatever it was, he was there. Right. He was there to to provide for us. So again, I'm a special case, and even though I have three dads, I'm a part of all of their lives. And no matter what I need, when I need it, all I have to do is call and ask, and they're there to provide for me. Wonderful. A.W., that's something that we also see as a common pattern. Mm -hmm. When the fathers are in the lives of their children, especially when the fathers are in the life of their daughters, mm -hmm. their daughter's life has never been the same. Uh, and we've seen like uh, uh, this is one of uh, the issues that Proverbs 2 to 6 is fighting for, because uh, in this nation, we have about 25 million households that doesn't have fathers wow. at home, right? The fatherlessness in this nation is a number one epidemic. When a father is missed in the life of the children, right, we see that 85% of those children end up in a foster home. 85% mm. of these children that don't have fathers ends up being in a prison, right? 
they don't finish school. In fact, I've heard the college football coaches, when there are some coaches like Kalapari, they're always looking for children that have fathers, right? Why? Because they know the fathers can bring the discipline into the lives of these children. Fathers can help them grow better. Fathers can be there. So our goal and hope in this mission, uh, Warden, is this, that we want to see these fathers come back into the lives of these children, right? When the fathers come back into the lives of these children, the crime in this nation will come down. Because uh, what we see also is that uh, whenever there is a, a family with a father and mother, as a unit, then those children are doing well in school. Those children are doing well in the society. It is always like the stats are stacked up against the children that doesn't have father. So that's why when you talk about your fathers, even though you have like a triple portion <laughs> of dads in your life, and I also think that may be another reason, A.W., that behind your memory, behind um, your your um, uh, radar screen. You have such a passion for this mission because uh, you want to see these fathers connect back into these children's mm -hmm. life, right? A.W., one of the things uh, that, that just like uh, comes to my mind is this. A couple of years ago, we asked these children, right? If God gives you three wishes, how would you use them, right? And I got like an interesting answers from our children. One of them said that she, this is an eight-year-old girl, right? She said like she would become invisible and she would go into the prison and sleep with her mom one night. Mm -hmm. That was all her wish was, right? And another one said that she would uh, go into the families or her homes and fill up the pantries when they for the ones that don't have food. That was her wish, right? These are like a six-year-old and eight-year-old kids, right? And the majority of these children told me that they wanted to be a lawyers. And I was starting to think, why lawyers, right? That's because they think the lawyers can fight for their fathers and bring them home. And they want to be a lawyer for their dad, right? And one of them was very interesting. She said that uh, she wants to go to a place when earth was still pure, right? It was amazing. These are six and eight-year-old kids talking to us about their wish. And many of these children said going and seeing their fathers is one of their wishes, right? A.W., if God gives you three wishes, it says, you know, Miss Elaine, you have three wishes. Tell me how would you use it for? If God tells you that uh, question, how would you use it, A.W.? Three wishes. If God gave me three wishes. Anything that you want. Anything that I want. I would want to take a break. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, A.W. Now that we are come after the break, tell us a little bit about the three wishes for a year. Okay. Um, if I had, if God gave me a blank check and allowed me to make three wishes, my first wish would be that everyone has the love of God in their heart. Wonderful. Because when you have the love of God in your heart, you're less likely to do what's wrong. Mm -hmm. You always want to do what's pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. So even if you wanted to do wrong, because of the love in your heart, you would think about what would God have me to do? Right. As they used to say, the WWJD, mm -hmm. what would Jesus do? Right. And you'll want to do what is right because that's that's the love that he has. Right. They, and that was, that's one of the wishes that I would wish for because if everybody's doing right, then we wouldn't have a need for prisons. Right. We wouldn't have needs for mental hospitals because everybody's mindset right. would be on, I'm going to do what's right because right. this is what Christ would have me to do. Um, my second wish would be longevity mm. of life, mm. Mm. that we would live life to the fullest 
until it's an overflow. Right. We would live to please God. We would live to be with our families longer. Death would be limited. Mm. You know, unless we ask God, I'm ready to come home. Right. But allow us to live to the fullest, to enjoy our families, to enjoy our children, our grandchildren, even our great grandchildren. Right. That that's that's one that's another fullness wish. of life. The fullness of life, yes. Right. The longevity of life. And then my third wish, of course, as many people, would be to be debt free. Right. <laughs> to be debt free, to have no worries and still spend wisely. Mm. You know, only get what you need. Some things that you want, but just don't overdo it. Right. So I mean, that's what I say to myself. Constantly, right. if I could be debt free, I would be more wiser in my spending and the things that I have. Wonderful. Yes, sir. Thank you, AW, for that answer. The three wishes. One thing that stuck for me was the love that you talked about, right? And the core of Proverbs two to six revolves around. People always think. Proverbs 2 to 6, when it comes to that, it's about the children, it's about education, it's about, uh, you know, washing of the feet and everything. But the core of Proverbs 2 to 6, if we can just like a take and condense all the messaging of Proverbs 2 to 6, AW, it is about the love mm -hmm. of the fathers towards their children, right? It's about that verse that says, uh, in the last days, I will send the prophet Elijah, mm -hmm. who would turn the hearts of the fathers towards their children and hearts of the children towards their fathers, right? The forgiveness part is such a core component of uh, Proverbs 26, which is a byproduct of love that these fathers are showing towards their children, right? And every time we have seen and measured this effect that it has on the children, we see that the children who have their fathers get on their knees and wash their children's feet, do really, really well in school, mm -hmm. right? We see these mothers change their attitude towards that father who is inside that prison, right? We see that change because of the new, renewed uh, relationship that they have after the father wash their children's feet, or in some cases, the wife feet. Uh, I, I remember when we were in South Dakota, and uh, here is a 10-year-old boy wanting her mom to come for the visit, when they came to visit him, right? Visit the father inside the prison. And the mom was refusing to come because uh, they had already divorced and it's going to bring up a lot of like a bad memories for them, mm -hmm. right? So she refused and refused and refused and she didn't want to come. But somehow, because of the pestering of this 10-year-old boy, she showed up, right? What she did not knew that day was that, uh, that the father not only was going to wash his son's feet, but instead... He was actually getting on his knees and washing his wife's feet and asking for forgiveness from her. He changed the whole perspective inside that room for that mother. I do not know what would happen to that marriage, but I do know that grace was introduced into the life of these uh, families. Right? And I know A.W., after every Proverbs 2 to 6 event, I've always heard, and I talked about it earlier as well, it changes the prison. It changes the, the, the atmosphere inside the prison. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened after we had a Proverbs 2 to 6 event at Trenton? Oh, wow. It was, it was phenomenal. The, the offenders talked about it for days. They went back to the dorms and they told the other offenders about it who didn't get a chance to participate. And even when I walked into the dorms, they were thanking me, mm. thanking me for bringing Proverbs 226 and want to know when am I going to do it again? And those that didn't get to participate, they came back and 
they was asking me, well, when is when are you gonna have it again? We wanna we wanna be a part of it and what have right. you. But the the mood of the guys changed. Right. Because of the restrictions that I had listed. Right. Before they could participate. Right. And I even gave them a a, a freebie. Right. Per se. Yes. I told them if you had disciplinaries previously, I'm gonna forgive them. Mm-hmm. And allow you to participate. Right. So as far as the disciplinaries that went down and the the behavior began to change. Right. Because I informed them that there would be more activities coming. Right. And I wanted them to be a part of it. Right. Um, I remember the day of the event, one of the gentlemen, his family didn't show up. And mm. he, he waited in the chapel for them for us to call him in so that he can greet his family. But they didn't show up. After that, I noticed a change in him. Right. He became more mature. Mm. And he began to always do what was right. Right. Be where he was supposed to be. Do what he was supposed to do right. up until his release. Right. And come to think of it, he sent me a message on Instant Messenger just to let me know that life was going good. Wonderful. He had a job. And he was very thankful that he had an opportunity to to meet me mm-hmm. and to do what he needed to do to get back home safely. Wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. A.W., that's one of the positive things that we see. Sometimes, like, uh, you know, life is not easy. Mm-hmm. Life happens. We don't know how to dance, right? When, when, when things like that happen, in this case, like what A.W. was talking about, there were so many times I see like uh, the families are not able to show up because of uh, some circumstantial or some health reason they are not able to show up. Or sometimes like, uh, you know, the, the hurt and pain is so real mm-hmm. that they are not able to get through to be there inside that prison walls, right? But there is always hope. There is always hope for the, for the God of this universe to work in your life and my life as well. And uh, A.W., as we wrap up today, I have this one question that I always ask uh, because uh, uh, the, the one thing that keeps us going every single day is not the cuteness of uh, Proverbs 2 to 6 or uh, how um, you know we have designed the Proverbs 2 to 6. What keeps us going every day is, is, is the Word of God mm-hmm. that is strengthening our heart and uh, uh, as, as, as we look at this uh, uh, journey that you have been through, I'm sure there are moments in your life that you had like a breakdown moments. Mm-hmm. Um, you had like, a, you know, uh, down moments in your life as well. What is the one verse that kept you going? What is that one verse that you would say like a man, that is something that I always hoped for. I'm sure there is like, for many, there is like so many verses, but uh, there's always a verse that gives you a strength and hope. What is that for you, A.W.? My favorite verse is Matthew chapter 6, verse mm. 33. Wow. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all all these things shall be added added unto unto you. you. We got to have Christ first in everything. Every decision, every thought, he's got to be first. And when he's first, he will not lead us astray. Right. Right. Wonderful, Wonderful. A.W. Uh, Matthew 6.33. That's one of my favorite verses as well. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Whatever we need, if we can put God first in what we do, then we don't need to worry about what we wear, what we eat, how we do things. It doesn't matter. God's going to show up in your life and my life. And what is so uh, also Pleasing today with this interview is that uh, we had a chance to interview a warden who poured so much of our heart towards these men in Trenton. When we had our very first event in Trenton, 
We had well over 450 people that showed up in Trenton. That chapel looked so full. There was no place for us to move. We have to step over people to get from one place to the other. I saw people come in with wheelchair. I saw people come in with oxygen tanks that day. And what was so beautiful about this day at Trenton that we had was uh, the most healing that I could remember when those mothers were crying on the shoulders of their sons. Uh, that was most moving that I could remember about the Trenton event. And what was also very moving when we went to Trenton the first time is like what A.W. talked about, that she was able to Whenever we go into a prison and we do an event like a Proverbs 2 to 6 event, we actually, uh, you know, mandate that the father or mother is disciplinary free for six months to a year. This is like a positive enforcement we have um, for those fathers or mothers to participate in Proverbs 2 to 6. And a lot of times uh, these men would do something and cause them not to have this time with their wife or children. Here's what A.W. Elaine did. She came into the room and she wiped out all their disciplinary action so that these fathers can participate uh, with their children for that one day. And as we walk into this Holy Week, uh, that's what I believe God is doing in your life and my life. He's going to wipe out everything clean. There is going to be a time that, you know, God's going to say, if, if all I need from you is to give your life to me, if you surrender your life to me, if you seek me first, more than anything the world could offer, I'm ready to wipe out everything that has been carried on your back. My brothers and sisters, as you are watching this podcast, are you dancing in the rain? I'm asking you to take a moment to go before God and put him first. Let him wipe out every past, every pain, every sickness, every unbroken or broken promises, everything that has just caused you to have your heart heavy, all of that, uh, you can leave that at the foothills of Calvary. And that may the good God of this universe bring your life back to its fullness. Thank you so much for watching uh, this podcast. I'm going to encourage every one of you that is watching this podcast to just like a click on the subscribe button that is below and click on the notification so that we can send you more videos, more podcasts, uh, as, as we build them, as we load them, you will be notified. Thank you so much for watching. Have an amazing day.